I'm very happy with this worship set that we have here. Uh, I think it's so important that we sing things that are biblical, that we sing truth, and we sing about Christ, and we celebrate Christ. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to worship the Lord together. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for our church. Thank you that we can gather. Thank you that we can worship you and praise you. Thank you for the kids. Pray that they will learn to love you and follow you, Lord. And uh, Lord, for everyone that made the extra effort to get here, Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless them, Lord, that you would work, that you have special, um, special something for each person, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand and let's worship the Lord together.
Amen. You may be seated for just a minute. That's some good lyrics. That's a good song right there. Uh, the next song, though, we're even going to go even more old school than that one. 3,000 years old school. So if you could, Iris, put up the first slide. i got to translate it because it's in Hebrew. I asked Patricia to sing this song here, and she loves it. And it's old school for me. I remember being uh, 10 years old or so, and my mother listening to this, probably on a cassette tape. <laughs> and El Shaddai is most often translated God Almighty. El Eliana Adonai is a combination of two names of God, roughly meaning most high God, I beseech thee, my Lord. And Erkam Kana Adonai is based on Psalm 18.1. And it says, I love you, my Lord. So just very simple. I don't know if you recognize this one. Uh, the announcements you can read in your bulletin. <laughs> I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward and we'll receive the morning offering. And I'll pray for us. Lord God, we beseech you, we come before you, and we say we need you. You are God Almighty, and we need you to be God Almighty in us. And Lord, as we think about the tithes and offerings of this church, we pray that as we give, we would be giving to advance your Lordship. You left that for us to do, Lord. You said you, that you're going to build your church, and the gates of hell are not going to stand against it, and that's who we are, Lord. And so, Lord, would we advance your kingship? For the kids that are going to go off to further Sunday school during the sermon, I pray, Lord, that you'd be their king. For us that are worshiping, I pray it wouldn't be just singing songs and saying it, but you'd truly be our king. You'd truly be our Lord God Almighty. And Lord, I pray, Lord, <laughs> we would be biblical. We wouldn't just say, oh, I'm going to make up what I think God is about. No, we'd find, figure it out in your word and follow it. Lord, as we give, I pray we would be giving to this kind of a church. Please bless these tithes and offerings to the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
from my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again in your family your blood flows through I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. sit down. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you that we are no longer slaves to fear and slaves to sin. But Lord, we are now your servants. And Lord, you are the one that said, come to me all who you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And my yoke is easy and my burden is light, Lord. You, you give us a burden, but it's light and you help us carry it. And it is oh, the things we do for you, Lord, matter for eternity, Lord God. And so we gladly do the tasks that you have for us. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys very much. I'll never forget the song that the African children sang at the orphanage in Uganda that our church in Sylvan Lake helped to establish. It went something like this. Be rooted, be rooted, be rooted, be rooted, be rooted, be rooted in Jesus Christ. Anybody know what that song is saying? Anyone? Be rooted, be riveted in Jesus Christ. <laughs> be rooted, be rooted in Jesus. It's a very, very biblical song, and it goes with our passage today. Be rooted. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1 through 14. I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and those in Laodicea. Remember, this is Paul writing to Col Colossi, the Colossians, and Laodicea is nearby. And for all who have not met me personally, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, 
namely Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit. And I delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, continue to live in him. Rooted and built up in him. We sang that song, Build My Life. And that's why, Patricia, I asked you to sing that one too. Be built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world, rather than Christ. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. That's why I wanted to preach Colossians, is for lines like that. And you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. In him, you also were circumcised in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave all your sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. So there's a lot here, and I'm going to go through it verse by verse. First, verse 1, Paul is struggling or contending, I'd have to think emotionally, spiritually, in prayer for these churches of people that he has not met. What you have to remember is that Paul is a real person writing a real letter to people in a real place about a real Jesus. Let's look at verse Two, he wants them, their hearts to be encouraged. He wants them to be knit together in unity. And then he wants them to understand who Christ is. Let's look at verse 3. Paul adds that in Christ is hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I have to think that the people in Colossae might have been enamored by secret knowledge and wisdom and mystery, very, very pagan ideas, you know. You, you, you study these different things and then you, you get more mysteries and you unlock spiritual truths. And he says, nah, everything you need is in Jesus. And that leads us right into verse 4. And let me just look at this here. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. There was possibly teachers who were arguing for something other than faith in Christ. So there was something off in their teaching, and, and scholars kind of debate, and they kind of say, well, what's going on with this? And, and they figure it was a mix of paganism and maybe Judaism, but whatever it was, it was off. And in verse 5, Paul says, I'm with you in spirit, but I want to see the firmness. I want to see the discipline of your faith. In, in the NIV here, it says the orderliness of your faith in Jesus Christ. So basically he's saying, not, not paganism and Jesus, not Jesus and following certain Jewish laws, but Christ and Christ alone. And that leads us right into 6 and 7. I love this right here. So then, just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, not just as your Savior, but as your Lord, continue to live in him, be rooted and built up in him. And I think this goes back to Jesus' invitation at the Sermon on the Mount. When I was a young Christian, the pastors always had an invitation. Put up your hand if you ever had an invitation. I see that hand. They'd say that too, right? And they'd tell you, you've got to come forward and accept Jesus at the end of the service. And Jesus, at the end of his wonderful sermon, never did that. I was like, what on earth? He's not doing an invitation. But what his invitation is, he says, listen, build your life on me and my teachings. 
Jesus said, I'm like a solid rock, and if you build your life on me, when the rains can't come, your house won't be smashed down. He says, if you build your life on the philosophies and the teaching of this world, it's like building your house on sand. H.W. Pickup. <laughs> I was like, should I say that? Oh, dear. Oh, that was muskeg. You build your life on the muskeg, and it's going to sink. You build it on the firm foundation of Jesus. And it won't. So I think that's what, uh, that's what Paul is, is, is talking about. He's going back to that. And there's something really important that we can't miss here. It says, overflowing with thankfulness, everyone. I think this is kind of like a tachometer for your spiritual life. Right? We, I got a tachometer. Maybe some of you don't in your, in your vehicle, but I got it in the CRV. And when you rev it real high, you know, you can get it going. And what I actually have to do right now is when it's cold, even, even now in the summertime, when I'm warming this thing up, I've got to pump it a few times so it doesn't stall. So the guy with the truck maybe beside me thinks I want to race him, which I don't. <laughs> but that tachometer for your spiritual life is thankfulness. If you are thankful, if you understand that Jesus died on the cross, that you, my king, would die for me, and that you didn't deserve that, You'll be thankful if you understand who Jesus is and you understand the blessings he's poured on you. If you understand the blessings that we have in North America, you will be thankful. And so that tachometer of thankfulness will be revving really high in your heart. And don't worry, you can't redline it. <laughs> There's no such thing as too much thankfulness in the Christian life. All right, let's look at verse 8. He's saying... Don't follow these teachers. He's saying they've got hollow and deceptive philosophy, and I love that it doesn't tell us exactly what their false doctrine was. Because here is what we would probably do. We just make sure and, av and avoid that exact false doctrine that they were teaching in Colossae. But we need to be aware of the same kind of thing in our day, and I'm going to share three of those with you in the so what section of the sermon. But there was teachers that were teaching the wrong thing. And he says, don't let them take you captive. And then he says, here's what you really got to be about. Let's look at verse 9. Jesus Christ and all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus Christ. That word fullness, as I understand, is a reference to the temple and how the temple, the Holy of Holies, was full of the presence of God. So he's saying in Jesus is the fullness, is all of God. He's fully divine. But basically, if you want to know about God, look at Jesus. If you want to get to God, get to Jesus. He is God's representative, God's son, God's Messiah. And he is divine, full of the same substance as God. And that's really good. Like, we, we should follow him, right? Right? We should follow him. But it gets better, everyone. Look at this, verse 10a. Check it out. What? You have been given the fullness of Christ. Christ lives in you. God, through his Holy Spirit, lives inside of you. Basically, I think what he's saying is, why are you looking somewhere else? Why are you looking to paganism or Jewish rituals? Why do we look at all the vain things that charm us most? We should have sang that one, Patricia. <laughs> too, too many song references to, uh, to sing them all. Why are we looking at all these other things when you have been given the fullness of Christ in you through his Holy Spirit? Let's look at 10b. He says he's the head of all rule and authority. And I figure Paul's saying, just in case you thought there was other sources of truth out there, just in case you thought there was other sources of righteousness, of knowing about God, nah, it's all Jesus, and he's the head over all of those other spiritual forces. And I think uh, we're going to talk about that a ton next Sunday. Let's look at verse 11 and 12. Now, everything was kind of really good, you know, and then, and then this verse come along, and this is why uh, uh, we've got the, the kids in, in the Sunday school today, and I'm preaching probably a few more verses than I normally would, because Paul uses a very adult Metaphor here. In the Old Testament, the sign that you were with God was circumcision. And in the New Testament, it's baptism. So he's comparing circumcision to baptism. There was possibly Jewish people that were saying, yeah, 
You're, you believe in Jesus, but you've got to follow some of these Jewish laws. And he's saying, no. He's saying, your old life was cut off, <laughs> and your new life is now with Christ. You were dead, and baptism represents dying to your old life and going down into the grave. And I always make sure that everybody's fully covered so it looks like a grave, and then pops back up. And sometimes I'll give them a three count when they're down there. One, two, three. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Spirit. Just to make sure that we have that imagery. And then you're alive to your new life. So he's comparing this. He's saying you need baptism and you need Jesus now. You are not following the old laws anymore. And just as an aside, if there's anyone here or online that has not been baptized yet and you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and you've died to your old life and you want to be alive to your new life, we will baptize you. And right now, limited time offer, <laughs> we could baptize you in the river or in the brass. We've done both places and it's beautiful. Every time we do it, it's powerful to do that. We can, we've got a tank and we can do it indoors during the winter time. Now, yeah, there's a towel. Actually, someone has purchased towels. So we've been waiting for whoever it is. If you're online or whoever it is, we've been waiting for you and praying for you to get baptized in this church because someone actually, by faith, brought the towels. Thanks for that. That's important to understand because we believe in baptism and we believe that that's the sign. That's the saying. I'm coming out. Like, I'm really Christian. I believe it. All right. Let's look at verse 13. You were dead and now you are alive. I love this. You were dead in your sinful nature. Now God made you alive. And uh, it's not just a metaphor, I don't think. I think it is a spiritual reality that you were dead in your sins. You had an old nature that rebelled against God. Naturally, you did what was wrong. But Jesus puts his spirit inside you. He transforms you, sometimes all at once in certain ways. And in, in some ways, it's slow and steady but he changes you from the inside out. And I don't think it's just a metaphor of leaving your old life behind. I think it is a spiritual reality. And again, this goes back to Jesus. He said to Nicodemus, the, the spiritual, supposedly spiritual leader, you must be born again. <laughs> that must have sounded pretty humiliating to him. Like, what? Born again? Like, I've been working my whole life to become uh, elite spiritually, an elite in the Bible. And he's like, no, you need to... You need to start all over. You need a supernatural heart transformation. And that's what I think Paul is talking about here. And then let's look at verse 14. This is so awesome. He took the charge that was against us. So I want you to imagine that I owe you between you and God. When you sin against God, he understands it. He realizes it. And there is a punishment to pay for your transgression against the holy God. I want you to imagine an IOU, a list of sins. Then I want you to imagine Jesus taking it, forgiving you for it, and then nailing it to the cross and saying, paid in full. And God's people said, amen. amen. That's what we believe. Uh, the Lord gave me this idea uh, for the young people out at camp. I was talking about repentance, and I was talking about forgiveness of sins, and there was a whiteboard, and I had a whiteboard, and my camp name is Beef. So on the top of the whiteboard, I wrote Beef Sins. And then I wrote on one side, just scribbles, not no particular sins. I said, here's the sin. And I said, here's the consequence. And then I wrote like this. And then I put a big old cross on it. And I shot it with water and uh, just contact solution. That's all I had. <laughs> and, and then washed it white as snow so they could see a blank slate, everyone. That's what Jesus does for us with the charge that we have against God. He dies for us and gives us a blank slate. And just as an aside, a great way to think about forgiveness is that I give somebody else a blank slate. Whatever charges against me have been occurred, I give them a blank slate because Jesus gave me a blank slate. So there is a lot here. So what, what difference does this make for us today? Let's just leave number 14 or put number 14 back up there. This is the first and the most important so what point for us we need to believe that Jesus did this for us and we must receive it as a gift. Paul talks about you received Jesus Christ as Lord. Everything in the Christian faith we receive. And the Bible says that we need to receive the kingdom like little children. 
So if I had 20 bucks, which I don't have 20 bucks, I wish I did in my pocket because it would make more sense. Uh, well, no, that, that's okay. And it's actually going to show the, the, point of the, the point of the idea. Because you know why? Because I would think that there's either strings attached or I've got to pay them back. Because that's what, that's what grown people do, right? If, if you take me golfing, I've, I, I keep that in my mind. That stays in there. There's still somebody from my internship took me for pizza. I still feel like I've got to pay him back. That's the way that we think. Like that was like 20 years ago, like a long time ago, all right? But if I said it to a young kid, hey, Here's 20 bucks, it's free, take it. They'd be way more inclined to take it, right? Because kids receive better than adults do. We think there's no way this is actually free. We think, oh, I don't deserve this. Oh, I gotta pay this back. Oh, the string's attached. Or it's a scam, right? Don't we? Yeah, that's what we think. And so we need to receive Christ as Lord and receive the free gift of our sins being forgiven. Now, there is a catch, though. If you receive Jesus as Lord, he's going to be your Lord. He's going to take over. And I love the analogy. I share it all the time, but I, I still love this analogy. It's like a free gym membership with the God of the universe, the Lord's gym. And you receive that free gift, but there's still work to do afterwards. But God is with you. God's your personal trainer in that now. But he still is your Lord. And so why wouldn't you believe this? Why wouldn't you receive your sins being forgiven by Jesus, him dying in your place? And why wouldn't you act on it? I'm just going to say a prayer. I don't care if it's the first time you say this prayer or the 500th time you've ever said this prayer, to believe and to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord God, actually, just a second. If you've never prayed this prayer, just pray along with me in your heart. Lord God, I believe in you. I receive you, Jesus, as my Lord. Come into my life. Save me from my sins. Cancel the debt that is against me. Nail it to the cross. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. It's point number one and the most important point. But point number two is pretty close. <laughs> Let's look at point number two. And I love it in the Bible when you can have a verse like this. We're going to go with, uh, sorry, 6 and 7, verse 6 and 7 now. So <laughs> just as you receive, so we've all prayed now and received Jesus Christ as our Lord. And then it says, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him. So build your life on Jesus and his words. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, sit as, at Jesus' feet and imagine that you're his disciple sitting at his feet and he's teaching you. Read the word of God, pray, spend time with God, orient your life around Jesus and his way. And that means obedience. So the, the reason you read the Bible isn't just to read it. It's great to spend time with the Lord and you need to do that. And his Holy Spirit will, will rub off on you and change you and transform you in those times. But you need to leave those times and do what the Word says. I've told you this story before, but uh, there was a, a person, supposedly, this is a legendary story, not sure of the truth of this story, but good story nonetheless. And he says, I don't know how you North Americans can read the Bible in a year. How do you even do that? Every time I read the Bible, it tells me to do something. I go and do it. <laughs> we read it, but a lot of times we don't go and do it. And so build your life on Christ. Be rooted in Jesus. It's the image of, of putting your roots down into firm soil, and that tree is not going to be uh, pushed over in a storm. A lot of us build our life or we root our lives in work. No, be rooted in Jesus. A lot of us root our lives in our kids, and then your kids get older and leave, which mine are starting to do. <laughs> And you think, what am I going to do with myself? Well, be rooted in Christ. Many of us, and myself included, we root our lives in pleasure and comfort. I like pleasure. I like comfort just as much as the next person. But that is not going to fully satisfy you. Build your life on Jesus. That's point number two. And then point number three is going to get kind of fun, kind of creative. And that's verse eight. Now, let's look at verse eight.
It says, see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. Now, we don't know exactly what that was in Colossae, but I'm going to tell you at least three things today that I think are in North America and in the North American church that are this same kind of thing. We can take that down for now. Thanks. So what is this nowadays? Human tradition, human thinking, human philosophy mixed with Jesus. The first one is consumerism and individualism mixed with the gospel of Jesus, mixed with Jesus. And it's the, it's all about you version of Christianity, right? Consumerism means I consume something. Individualism means me. It's all about me. And you're going to hear this even in music. You're going to hear this at churches. It's all about you and what you get from God. The good news is it's not all about you. When you come to church, you need a good dose of it's not about you. It's about him. And he helps you to love others. And that's how you have joy. Jesus, others, yourself. The J is Jesus. The O is others. And the Y is yourself. That's what the Bible clearly teaches over and over again. Now, do we get stuff from God? Of course we do. Of course. Do we get personal salvation? Yeah. But we also get a Lord, and we also get to be part of a community and a part of an army. And you hear me talking about this all the time. And I don't know who all the preachers are that are preaching this, but you know what? Just know the, the faulty teaching, and then you can address it. And I don't like preachers that, that call down other people. You know why? Because the scripture says, what measure you measure to others will be measured to you. Right? And I'm sure that I've got things wrong. If, if I knew what they were, I would change them. <laughs> but I'll call out the false teaching. And any time you've got, it's all about you and Jesus together, there's something off there. It's all about him. He is the Lord. Okay, then there's a second kind of stream of teaching that kind of goes with that, and that's Jesus plus the American dream. And, and you'll hear this. Be whoever you want to be. So Jesus is going to help you to be whoever you want to be, and if you work hard enough, you can be whoever you want to be. But that's not actually Christianity. Because if you wanted to be an astronaut fly to the moon, or the Arizona desert, depending on your theory on this. <laughs> but if you want to be an astronaut, and God says, no, my will for you is to be a missionary, my will for you is to preach, you need to preach. The gospel is, and the good news, is that God has a plan for your life. And it's not necessarily always your plan. He made you. He knows what's better. You'll also hear, become your true self. And a lot of times when they say, become your true self, they mean your true self according to what you think. And this is so close to what Jesus does, but so far away. Because God is the one that made you, and made you, the one that, sorry, the one that makes you, knows the one that you're going to become. And so, you're not supposed to be your true self according to what you think, but according to what God says, to become more like him, to become more like Jesus. And the Bible says it so clearly. You are God's work of art or God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works that God prepared in advance for you to do. So it's not, hey, I'll be whoever I want to be. I'll be my true self according to what I think it is, but who God made me to be and is continually remaking me to be. So we got to watch out for that teaching. And the third one, I preached a whole sermon on this, but spiritual elitism, we got to watch out for this. It's the Jesus plus teaching. So here's what will happen. People will say, oh, you need, you need Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus and receive Jesus, but you also need to have spiritual gifts. And that is great. You need spiritual gifts. The problem happens is when the people who have certain spiritual gifts will say, the ones that don't have the same gifts as me aren't even really Christian or aren't even really saved. And usually, 
It's prideful. And I've never heard anyone say, uh, well, the people that have different gifts than me, you know, it's usually always the ones that they have. And a spiritual gift is something you didn't earn. So watch out for the Jesus plus. But then there's also those in the, you know, Alliance Church and Wesleyan and Nazarene. And, and, and we talk about knowing God and the depth of our relationship with God and, and sacrificing for God and really, really uh, you know, getting into the word and experiencing him, though. Not just studying theology, but experiencing God. And you know what some of those people will say, unfortunately? Ah, oh, I don't really know if the people that, that, that don't know God as good as I do are really even Christian. No. No, that's not. It's Jesus plus. And that's what we found even in our Bible college. It was like, became a religion of works, where the one work was to get to know God. And should you get to know God? <laughs> yes, for sure you should. People that don't know God, should they get to know him more and have a relationship with him? Of course. Should we ask God for spiritual gifts? Should we work in spiritual gifts? 100%. But let's not start saying that people that don't have the same gifting or same relationship with God as us are not really Christian. Third thing. Third thing is Jesus plus zeal. And you'll see Christians that have all kinds of zeal, and usually they have zeal for the word and zeal for theology. And they'll say, you know what? I don't even think that people are, are Christian that don't have as much zeal as I do and as much gusto in their faith as I do. I'm willing to die for Jesus, and I'm willing to go out and, and do whatever, and I call them the Navy SEALs for Jesus, and hallelujah, we need Navy SEALs for Jesus. We need those, but not everybody's a Navy SEAL for Jesus. You got the disciples. They were Navy SEALs for Jesus. Then you also got Lydia, the seller of purple, and they hung out with Lydia and hung out in her house, and I'm pretty sure she put on a good spread for her. Because if you sold purple in the first century, it means you were rich. So we need people with different gifts. And lots of times people that have zeal will say, ah, if you're not as zealous for the Lord as me, you're not even really saved. Here's the thing. If you read your Bible, it says not to judge other people, not to judge their salvation, not to write them off, not to say who will ascend or who will descend, but preach the word to everyone. Here's what you do. If you have more spiritual gifts than the next person, or you know God, you're closer to God than the next person, or you've got zeal, you come alongside. The scripture calls the Holy Spirit the paraclet. And the idea there is a big boat that's going to come alongside a small boat. So we need, especially people who are zealous, people who are on fire, to come alongside. And instead of saying, hey, you're not even really a Christian, be like, come on, be zealous with me for Jesus. Who's with me? And we'll say, hey. And then when it gets tough, we're going to need a little bit more encouragement. <laughs> but in spirit, we are, we'll say amen, and we'll try and walk with you in the zeal that you have. Those of you that know God and spend time with God and have a relationship with God and experience God in amazing ways, we need to hear your stories. We need you to inspire us. Be called alongside of us like that boat and say, hey, here's what I know about Jesus. Do you know him in this way? Have you experienced him in this way? Do you have this kind of depth? Some of us may be like the, the people that didn't even know about the Holy Spirit. Hey, we haven't even heard that there is such a thing as that kind of depth. Help us. And those that have spiritual gifts, God gives them freely to you. Different gifts to different people, but he gives gifts freely. To say, hey, here's what this gift looks like. Don't be afraid of the spiritual gifts. They're beautiful. But what we need to understand is that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That is the pure gospel. And then he gives us these amazing gifts. So I just call that spiritual elitism. And, and you may be saying, well, how do I know if I'm spiritual elite or whatnot? It usually is accompanied by pride. There's usually a sense of I'm better than everyone else. And if you look at Jesus, he, 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 he was better than everyone <laughs> He just was. And he, and he was humble and lowly of heart, it says. Right? So, oh, man. Okay. You guys, come on up, play some music here. Play the, yeah, the bridge, I'll build my life. Rick, if you can play that in the background. I want to give you some opportunities here. 
We talked about believing that Jesus has nailed your sins to the cross. We talked about building your life on him. And then we talked about some misunderstandings of, of the Bible to stay away from. Consumer and individualism. You know, it's not about you. It's about him. And that's where you find your greatest joy when it is all about him. And your life is about him and about others. And then being the person that you think you should be versus the person that he wants you to be. And then the Jesus plus. There's all kinds of different ways, but you need to know that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. So just take some time to pray. Make this sermon personal in your own heart as Patricia and Rick just play that build my life. Maybe there's something that stood out to you you need to go back to in the sermon and you say, you know what? I got to build my life on Jesus. I got to do this more. I got to do this better. Or God, forgive me for this or that. Just take personal responsibility for your personal relationship with God right now. Spend some time in prayer. up your prayer and I'll lead us in prayer. Lord Jesus, we want to build our lives on you and you are enough. Not you plus whatever the thing is that we want or whatever the philosophy is. It's just you and you alone and and the real you, Jesus, you are exalted on the right hand of God, and we can know you, and we can experience you, Lord, and we want that. Forgive us for all our sins. Lord, there's so many, we can't even, we can't even count them all, we don't even know them, <laughs> Lord, and, and thank you that you never give up on us, Lord, but we, we need you, and we need you to keep helping us <laughs> to become more like you, and to really love you. And God, thank you, Lord God, that you do. Lord, so we commit our hearts to you. And as we go, may we go in victory and may we root our lives in you. Lord God, may we not just talk about it, but may we do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Be rooted in Jesus Christ. Have a great Sunday.